Guy here with a quick message before we get on with the pod. As a thank you to our most dedicated and loyal viewers and listeners to Blood Red, we're inviting you to join our Blood Red club. By joining, you'll get access to insider transfer content as well as interviews with former favourites and those connected at Anfield. All you need to do is head to bloodredpodcast.co.uk, enter your email address and our exclusive content will head to your inbox. That's bloodredpodcast.co.uk. Thanks. Now on with the show. Hello and welcome to the latest Liverpool.com podcast here on the Blood Red channel. I'm Matt Addison, your host for this week with regular guest James Martin on the show with me and Blood Red's Kai Delaney. I'll be Jordan Henderson dictating the flow of the podcast from deep. I'll let you guys argue over who's Naby Keita and who is Harvey Elliott. But the premise for today's show is quite simple. With one week to go until the transfer window slams shut, what more do Liverpool need to do? And are we expecting them to do any more business? We'll be talking ins and outs over the next hour or so and be having a think about the state of the squad compared to Liverpool's title rivals too. We shouldn't forget though, James, first of all, that Liverpool have actually made a signing, a £36 million signing at that earlier in the summer. And I think that has gone a little bit under the radar. We've not seen him yet, but it will be an important addition to Liverpool. Yeah, when you said we were talking ins and out, I thought you said we'd be talking ings for a second. I was getting excited. I was like, yes, here we go. Here we go. We'll I fill the time easy. From, from your oh, yeah, buzzing with that, of course. But yeah, um, so back to the actual Liverpool news. Sadly, we can't just do ings podcasts every week. Um, yeah, Canate, very easy to forget that he came in just because, not only because it was loaded at the start of the window, but it was, you know, wrapped up well before then. So we knew it was happening. Then he came in. He had the preseason. There was that kind of second wave of excitement, if you like. I don't know if I should say second wave at the moment, but you know, you know um, <laughs> we had that kind of that that excitement, all the content coming out around it, and then seeing him for the first time. But yeah, it does just feel very much like old news. Um, but that doesn't detract from the signing. If anything, it makes it better because he's had the full preseason to bed in. He has that kind of Klopp training in the bag, and it means well. It also with with where Van Dijk and Gomez are, he's not coming in where we have to throw him in either. So just everything about it, it has worked out nicely in apart from the fact that it doesn't give us the kind of buzz of we've got a new signing because it, it feels like old hat. But but yeah, it's it wasn't an insignificant piece of business, what, thirty five million pounds around that mark. So yeah, it's it shouldn't be disregarded. It was a problem area last season, arguably the biggest problem area last season, and the club got it boxed off nice and early. So yeah, great business. And if it does turn out to be the only thing Liverpool do, there'll be some disappointment because there are other areas that should be strengthened, which we'll be discussing. But it wouldn't be the worst window in the world. He's, he's a very promising young talent. It's, like I say, an area we needed to strengthen. So, so yeah, he should be talked about more than he is, I would say. I think it, it almost works in, in Liverpool's favour, doesn't it, Cam? I mean, the fact that you know, Liverpool have, have signed this player, but no one seems to have noticed. It, they are going under the radar, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing going into this season. You look at, at Chelsea, Manchester United, the expectation there is that they will win the league, and not all of them can do it. Liverpool can just sort of fly under the radar a little bit. Yeah, of course. I think that that's the thing, especially when you see some of the fees involved in some of the transfers. There's some, you know, 97 for Lukaku, 100 million for Grealish, and of course, Sancho and Varane coming in at Man United. As you say, the pressure is on almost to hit the ground running and transform certainly a couple of those those teams straight into title contenders, if not title winners. But when when you get your business done so early and certainly for a smaller fee as well, and, and Canate was at 35, 36 million, um, there, there's not as much pressure, pressure on him there. And I think the fact that he's not also had to come straight into the team as well, because it, it seems as... A, as if it could be Van Dijk and Matip, certainly for the first few games of the season. We're then going to have the international break and it may be you know, into September or, or the Cups possibly into his season after. So you've got that chance to ease him in. And, and you know, as you've seen with people like Andy Robertson, Fabinho in the past, it may even be a few months before he, he really gets that, that chance. And then if he's had the training with Klopp, is able to come in and, and hit the ground running from there. We're going to have a chat about all of the other elements of the squad, but just in terms of those centre-backs, it, it does really show the squad depth that Liverpool have got, Kai. I mean, you were in the, the press conference with Jurgen Klopp on Saturday and he kind of made a point saying that all central defenders would get game time and then he kind of corrected himself a, a little bit and said, well, 
at least four of them will. And that sort of feels like how it, it is for Liverpool this season. It, it doesn't say a lot, though, for, for Nat Phillips's future and possibly Rhys Williams. We, we might see him go out on loan as well. Yeah, it, it was an interesting one. As you say, he was very quick to correct himself. He said they all will, but he said we've got six great options that all play and then straight away down to four. So, I mean, you, you'd maybe expect Phillips to get a permanent move before the end of the window. We've seen Brighton and Southampton have been linked over the last last few weeks um and then yeah reese williams may be alone to possibly a league one club something like that you may expect that to go through where he can get regular minutes week in week out but the only thing is you don't want to leave yourself too short especially after what happened last season i think four is is the number i think last season you know only happened because they let love one go and they didn't replace him so they they started the season with just the three senior options but no certainly for the the remainder of this season, and it's only just started, but it, it seems as if it's going to be Van Dijk plus one for most of the games and possibly having the opportunity to rest him. Yeah, as we saw with Robertson against Burnley, where you got Simicast able to come in and and give Robertson that rest in, in a few games here and there. If you're able to do that with Van Dijk after he's just coming back from a long time out, you've got a great, great um, variety of options there now. And, you know, you could have Canate and Matip Matip and Gomez so there's um there's certainly options and it's it's looking worlds apart from the situation at centre-back for Liverpool last season. Are those four options enough do you think James can Liverpool afford to get rid of both Nat Phillips and Reese Williams whether that's a, a loan or or a permanent or would you like maybe one of those to to stay just in case? Yeah I'm glad you asked because I was going to make that point um I would not like to see them both leave i you know, with any set of four centre backs, there'd be that niggling doubt. Like, mm, is it enough? Probably in most cases. But then, yeah, when three out of those four are coming back off long-term injuries, and the fourth one is Canate, who's had a lot of injuries here and there as well. Like, he, he didn't play many games last season in the Bundesliga for various reasons in terms of injury. Um, so yeah, you can't you can't fully rely on that set of four. Like, it's one of them where it would probably be fine, but if if it's not fine and you've let Phillips and Williams go, who bear in mind, you know, basically were the, the spine of the team as we made it to Champions League at the end of last season. So we know they can do a job. Like we also know it's not ideal, of course, but it, they're not, it's, it's not a million miles away from their level. Whereas if we let them both go and something happens to, well, God forbid, but let's say three of the, of the four centre-back options at once, which we know can happen. We saw it last season. Then who's next up? It's probably Billy Cometio, right? Or if not him, then we're putting Henderson back at centre back, um, which nobody wants to see again. Um, similarly with Fabinho, we can't really afford to lose him in the number six. We saw that before. So yeah, I'd, I'd definitely rather keep one of them around. Um, and you'd ask the question with Reese Williams as well. I mean, Kai mentioned it would probably be realistically a League One loan, maybe lower end of the Championship if, if you could get that sorted. But you ask the development question there. It's like, is that well, how much better for him is that than staying in and around the Liverpool squad, training with the first team every week? He's got Van Dijk to sort of learn from in that left centre-half role. Um, there are similarities in their game. Obviously, they're poles apart in terms of the quality at this point, but it, it does seem in many ways like an ideal mentor. So if you if you leave the club on loan, then you lose that for a season. So yeah, that kind of balance of for, for his own development and also as that kind of emergency fifth option my inclination would be to let Phillips go and hold on to Williams. James, I, I just want to, I, I, I would agree with you on that. If it, if it was me, I would probably loan Williams and, and keep Phillips. I think he had a great season and has shown that he can come in even for 10, 12 games if needed. But going off Klopp's records, you know, he, he let Klein go, leaving us with, with no backup right back before. He let Lovren go and he asked... He seems like he's going to let Shakiri go for a, maybe a lesser fee than we could have could have got for him because he's asked to go. He, he tends to put the players' wishes before maybe Liverpool's in uh, at times. I think he might do that again. Yeah, uh, I think with that's that's definitely true with Phillips. Um, like you say, he he probably impressed the most of the pair last season. And you look at the clubs who are interested, supposedly like the Burnleys, the Southamptons. You think, yeah, that makes sense. He'd be he'd be a star there. He'd in week in week out and he probably has earned that kind of move and you can definitely yeah you could see Klopp saying okay you know fair play to you um off you go and best of luck but I feel like Williams probably isn't going to be in that same situation where he's 
agitating for a loan move. Um, it's because he is still very young. I, if Klopp sits him down and says, "Look, I think it's best for your development, and you might get game time, uh, and even like maybe, you know, you can play in the in the cups or something." It's not ideal. Obviously, every player is going to want to be playing more than that, but it's, it's just a hunch. But I don't think necessarily Klopp would get grief off both of those options in terms of really pushing for that move. But you know, time will tell. I think the other thing that, that plays into it for me as well, Kai, is that you look at, at the full-back situation. I think the left-back is, is certainly sorted now with Costa Simicas's early form. But on the other side, I've still got a couple of doubts over Nico Williams. And I wonder whether Joe Gomez's minutes actually might come at right-back rather than at centre-back to begin with, just to sort of get him onto the pitch somehow. Because as long as Matip and, and Van Dijk are fit, you'd expect those to, to be that pair. I wonder if if that's a possibility. It, it wouldn't be ideal, but I suppose for him, it's it's better than not playing. Yeah, you, you're going to want Joe Gomez to have some minutes somewhere along the back four before <clears throat> before being thrown thrown straight back into you know 90 minutes against whoever it may be. But there was an interesting moment for me uh, at the Burnley game on Saturday. I was sat just in front of the cop behind the goal, and when Simakas went down, and it appeared that he might have to come off injured. Um, I know Robertson was on the bench, but he had obviously just come back from that injury himself. And it was actually Joe Gomez that stood up, took his bib off and was kind of getting ready in case. So that suggested he was going to be coming on as a left back. So clearly Klopp and the coaching staff still see him as an option at, at left back or, or the right back uh, positions, you know, if, if needed. And James, what, what would you do in, in fullback areas? I know there's been sort of a question mark over Nico Williams in terms of possibly he might go somewhere, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case now. It's gone a bit quiet on that front. Would you be happy enough with Nico as a, a backup option for this season? Uh, yeah, I think I would. I've been back and forth on it because, like you say, I, I do have some doubts there. But the thing is, it's not a competition situation. I mean, Trent is the undisputed first choice and probably will be for you know, the next decade all being well. So it's it's not like you need someone who is going to be really pushing that space, who's able to play regularly. I mean, he just needs to be able to fill in when needed. And I think he is at that level. And I think a key thing as well is the kind of profile of fullback as much as the ability. And he is in that sort of similar mould to Trent, even if the levels are quite extreme. So in the sense that he has those same kind of attacking instincts, He's been at the club a while now and has no doubt been trained in those kind of methods, probably with an eye on a route to the first team as the kind of Trent understudy. So he, he knows what's needed of a right back in the Liverpool system. And he, he offers it more than Gomez, who's always going to be more defensive minded, being you know a centre back by trade. So yeah, if, if it's if it's the odd game as rotation, or if it came to it and there was a longer injury absence. I wouldn't mind having to rely on Williams. It it wouldn't be ideal, but in terms of looking at priorities in the window, you'd need to spend a reasonable amount to get someone who's an obvious upgrade as a second choice. So I think my inclination is to say, you know what, it's not our biggest problem. We can probably get away with it. Yeah, I'm sure if Liverpool had the choice, they'd keep him and, and just not have that problem to solve. It would be interesting to see if there is any more sort of interest in Nico Williams between now and the end of the window in a week's time. But Kai, we'll move on to the midfield. Obviously, the, the big question, the big hole, if you like, is Genie Wijnaldum. We all have made our feelings clear plenty of times on what Liverpool need to do with him across this summer. But has the first couple of, of games, and I suppose pre-season as well, changed your mind at all? Is there any part of you that thinks maybe they don't have to, to sort of replace him? Or are you still very much in the camp of you want to see someone come in? Yeah, um, my, my mind has been completely changed, to be honest, since you know when he left, you're thinking this is a player that's played almost every game under Klopp for however many years, and he's you know one of the first names on the team sheet. I think, was it 36 games in the league last season? Possibly Something all but, like all that, but yeah. two. So when, you, when you're taking someone who's that important, and not only in terms of his... Um, you know, stature and, and performances, but also his availability. I think that's one of the biggest things you, you, you're going to miss with him. But when when you're losing someone of that, yeah, initially your initial reaction is you want someone in, one in, one out. Um, but having seen pre-season and, and the last couple of games, I think we have more than enough bodies there to cope with it. Uh, I think Naby Keita is, is really going to be now or never for him. You know, his, his injury 
struggles have been well documented since he signed for Liverpool, but he's always had one album ahead of him. And he obviously he's, he has had his niggles as well, but he appears to be really in the, the first one of the first times in his Liverpool career that he's he's keeping injury free. He's had a full preseason, yeah, and he's you know, started the first two games as well. So if he's able to keep that spot that seems to be just left of the midfield three and, and really cement that position down as one of his own, then that's going to be a great option for Liverpool this season. And then of course, you know the the list of, of other names goes on, doesn't it? Fabinho, Henderson, Thiago. Um, I'm sure Harvey Elliott we're going to come on to as well. He's, he was fantastic against Norwich. Uh, sorry, against Burnley. So, um, yeah, f- for me, I think we, we've got enough enough bodies and enough quality there to cope without him now. I still think, James, that it's it's a little bit of a gamble, a little bit of an unnecessary risk. I think, for me, it hinges purely on can Naby Keita stay fit for the majority of this season? And in my head, the, the answer probably to that question is is no, even if the signs so far have been quite good. Yeah, you you just can't rely on it. I mean, I think we're all hopeful and, you know, there's reasons that we tell ourselves that this is going to be the year. Like, you know, Andre Schlumberger came in in January, didn't they? And he's been working with him on this specialised routine and he's barely been injured since. So you're thinking, OK, well, that's it's about half a year where he's, he's had an injury-free run, even if he wasn't playing towards the back end of the last season. It, it's promising and, you know, he's He's had the first two league games on top of that run in pre-season. So he has been getting minutes under the belt without getting injured. So, yeah, I think we can be cautiously optimistic, but it is gung-ho to rely on it. Um, The question is, how much are Liverpool really relying on it, though? Because the first choice midfield three, you would have to say, is surely still Fabinho, Thiago, Henderson. So, you know, if if you lose Keita, and even if you lose one of the the first choice three on top of Keita, then you still have options in in Harvey Elliott, in... um, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain potentially, uh, James Milner if it comes to it. I mean, I think we're all at the stage now where that's an emergency option. We don't want to be seeing him playing too regularly. But, you know, he's still fine. He covers the ground better than anyone still at, you know, 35. And if it's the case of the odd game here and there, I think it's churlish to moan about it because, you know, he, he does a job. Um, and it's not like anyone's suggesting he should be starting 38 games and filling the Vinalden role. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think we I think we could get away with it. I, I'd be more comfortable with with one more coming in though. Yeah, I think the sort of availability question. It, it's not just Naby Keita, is it? We know Oxley Chamberlain was was missing at, at the weekend for purely you know family and, and reasons for for his wife or girlfriend being in in labour. But there's a bit of a question mark over him, Kai. There's a bit of a question mark even over Jordan Henderson and Fabinho, Thiago. Even you could put him into that bracket. I think. There are a lot of options, but there is a bit in my mind that I can see sort of four or five of them being injured at the same time at some point. And you're then sort of playing it into, is it a game that Liverpool can win even with that being the case? Or is it a Champions League quarterfinal and you live to regret that? Yeah, that, that's the thing. I think, um, you know, we, we were talking a couple of days ago off air. Did you say Fabinho had missed, was it 24 or 26 games over the last two seasons? 24, yeah. 24 games so you know quietly missing almost a third of a third of each season there um I mean we know Henderson's you know he can be out for five six weeks at a time as well so all of our options tend to you know they're susceptible to maybe a few weeks here and there and like you say the worry is if they maybe will happen at the same time and it gets to a, a big game where your whole season hinges on it and you're stuck with maybe I don't want to say stuck with but you could be fielding a, an Elliot Milner and Cater option or, or something like that as you three in a you know your biggest game of the season which you you maybe wouldn't want that so um it's it's whether it's whether Klopp's happy to to go in with the options he has or if you are looking at your competitors in the league you know they they seem to be stockpiling you only have to look at Chelsea's bench yesterday and, and it was absolutely ridiculous Kante Thiago Silva the, you know, the, the names go on the, that strength and depth that they've got and of course you know we know city as well so it, it would you could see the the benefits of maybe just that one extra body in there just to give yourself an option and and just peace of mind really if if anything does happen but having said that i think seven options into three we should be okay 
and we can't just forget Curtis Jones as well. Like That's I feel it. like I feel like we have. Um, but he played thirty four games all competitions last season. Like Klopp knows he can rely on him. It's it, he did very well. Like it maybe wasn't as spectacular as you know some of us were expecting in terms of having watched the youth teams. He's more of a kind of tricky, skillful player, and then he comes into the team doesn't necessarily perform that same role. But in terms of the kind of functional aspect of the Klopp midfield, he performed it to a T when he was called upon for the most part. Um, he'll be the mo- he'll be the most aggrieved at the at the sort of rising star of Elliot, I would suggest, in the sense that he seems to have found himself below him in the pecking order. It's it's early days, uh, and of course he missed Norwich because of a concussion protocol, rather than just not being picked. But even in pre-season when he was available, it was Cater and Elliot, Cater and Elliot, uh, with Jones nowhere to be seen. And then we get to the Burnley game. Would have been a shoe in for Jones last season. You would have said with with the absences that were there, and he's on the bench and doesn't come on, and Elliot gets the full ninety. So it's it's tough for him personally, but in terms of for Liverpool, it's great news because that's that's a, like it's an under the radar elite option just to have as essentially a spare. So yeah, I, I think in terms of the extra body you need, that that could be the guy because we know he can do it. Let's have a, a bit of a chat then about Harvey Elliott. Obviously, me and, and you this morning, James, were talking about Zerdan Shakiri having moved on. The, the suggestion that the plan from Liverpool really is to replace his minutes with um, obviously Harvey Elliott playing that midfield or possibly a wide role moving forward. Cade Gordon is there as well. You don't want to sort of block his path. And I think there's been a little bit of a surprise from a few people that that is the line coming from the club. But at the same time, we've we've known this for, for a long time. It, it shouldn't really be a shock that Harvey Elliott is going to take on those minutes of Shakiri because we knew that at the back end of, of last season. Yeah, it's it's not really surprising. I, th- I think the fact that Elliott has shifted in so many people's heads now to a kind of staple midfield option, even though, like, you know, two months ago, we just presumed he'd be, like you say, just picking up those Shakiri minutes in the kind of backup Salah, slightly different forward kind of role. Um so, yeah, I think maybe it's just a case of those changing perceptions of Elliot means that we're now thinking, OK, well, he's covering two positions if Shakiri leaves. But it's just an overestimation of how much Shakiri has been involved in the last season or two. Like, he's just not played very much. It, I think last season in the league, it totaled just over six games in terms of the minutes he was involved in. It's it's It wasn't a huge squad role. Uh, it It's tricky because he he's just such a good player. Like, he's one of the most naturally talented players who was in the squad. Um, I, I think you could go as far as to say that. It's just, he was always not really, well, he was never going to be a staple in the team just because he was never an obvious clock player. It was just too good a deal to turn down at the time, really. So it's hard looking and kind of pinning that on either of Elliot or Gordon saying, okay, step up, be Shakiri, because no one can really do that because he's such a unique player, such a talented player. It's it's not fair to ask them to be like for like, but to ask them to be like for like in the squad with such a limited involvement, picking up the cup games more than anything else and then just covering the first team, that's fine. I mean, they're promising youth players, like you say, we don't want to block their path. It's not like, again, we're asking them to play every game. So yeah, I think it, it shouldn't come as a surprise and it shouldn't come as an unpleasant surprise because if it means we see them you know, occasionally off the bench or in the odd game here and there, that's great. We, surely that's what we want. That's what the academy is for, as well as making money, of course. But ideally, we want to see these players coming through. And if we think they're good enough, then then great. Give them the chance. Yeah, absolutely. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a player as good as Harvey Elliott for that £9.5 million that mm. Liverpool have got from Leon. So it's not quite so simple. Just before we move on to the forwards then, Kai, I know this is something else we had a, a chat about the other day, just in terms of that number six position. I thought Jordan Henderson was brilliant against Burnley in that role, but he is better further forward. And for me, if I was going to buy a midfielder this summer, it would be that kind of number eight who can play naturally as a number six as well. I think someone like a Florian Neuhaus, who I've spoken about a lot this summer, very much would be on board with with getting him in. And and that's the reason why, really. If if Fabinho isn't there without Wijnaldum, there's not really a natural holding midfielder as much as Henderson did do really well at the weekend. He did, yeah. He, he was... He was brilliant in his, his first game back. But um, in terms of specialist number sixes in the squad, it's, it's really only Fabinho. And, you know, his, his importance to the team can't be underestimated. I don't think it is at all. And if he's if he's fit and firing, then he plays in, in pretty much every game this season, as far as I'm concerned. But you do want that option to maybe just bring him out if you've got three games in a week or you can play 
give someone else the option who who is a, a specialist in that position and the henderson can do it he can do it fantastically well and has, has played almost full seasons there at times and we know tiago can also play there and, and certainly did it for Bayern sometimes in that that deeper pivot or even as a a four two three one and you can have the, the two sixes there together but um yeah, it, it would be great to have just that just that extra body just to take the pressure off Fabinho a little bit and allow him the break throughout the course of the season. Throwing a curveball out there, uh, Joel Matip has 50 career appearances at, at number six. Um, he played there a lot for Schalke, obviously a while back now. But we've talked about how stacked we are at centre-back now. So, you know, you can't rely on it because Matip's a very injury-prone, of course. But let's say Matip's fit. For a couple of games here and there, you move him forward. You can see more of his, you know, giraffe-style marauding runs out from the back. He's got even more freedom to do it. You love to see it. And then you can just play, you know, Van Dijk and Gomez or Van Dijk and Canate. It's it's not the worst solution in the world. No, I, I actually be. think um, this season, perhaps not this season, but maybe moving forward, we could see Henderson more as a six as opposed to an eight, just as he gets slightly older, as we did with Steven Gerrard as well. You know, he dropped back there and as he got older. So maybe Henderson's got, a year or two left as a, the marauding eight that we know and love, but he could could well find himself as a six more frequently than not. Yeah, it's certainly a possibility, isn't it? But we'll move on to the forward line then. I think that's the area, if Liverpool do make a signing, it's probably the most likely position that they would bring somebody in. And I think it's gone a little bit under the radar, James, that Divock Origi wasn't on the bench against Burnley. I assume there was no sort of injury or anything like that, but there were two goalkeepers on the bench. So if he wasn't injured, that's probably a bit of a, a transfer hint, really, for, for Liverpool fans to, to look at. Yeah, it's a good spot from you. Like, I hadn't noticed either until you pointed it out to me this morning. But yeah, it feels, feels significant, whether that's in terms of imminent transfers or just in terms of how little he's, he's in the plans for this season. Um, yeah, if he's not in the plans, then you'd hope there's a lot of work going on to shift him because there's no point having him around if he's going to get benched for two keepers. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be ideal from a Liverpool point of view. In, there's been a lot of talk about the registration situation in terms of the non-homegrown slots. Um, I don't know exactly where we stand on that, but I think if we get rid of Shakiri and Origi, there's one more potentially kicking around in terms of freeing up a slot for an incoming. Um, so that would be the hope. I don't think the club will get anything near what they want for Origi. That's that's my only concern. It's whether they really just go, OK, we'll cut our losses and make the sale for however much we can get for him. With, I mean, it, it could be as low as, as the Shakiri price. It could be eight or nine. I mean, it's, it's not played. It's... I mean, it's difficult because again, there's he's, he's had the, he's had his moments, of course, iconic moments for Liverpool, and and he's shown it for Belgium at times as well. Like when we when we first signed him, he was he looked really promising on the international stage. But again, this is all all stuff that's happened quite a long way in the past. Now it's not really entirely his fault because he's not had the minutes to show the player he can be. But for any buying club, you're looking at it like, well, okay, we haven't seen it, so we can't. We can't spend that big on it, particularly in this pandemic market. So, yeah, that, that's the big question mark. It's just how much Liverpool are prepared to say that, you know what, it's fine. We'll take way less than we want. Um, and maybe as the window draws to a close, like you say, one week to go, maybe that's now the time when that sort of thinking kicks in, particularly if there is that kind of extra option for the front line lined up who we want to be able to register. That's the hope. Um if it all falls through and and it is a Rigi, then I'm sure Klopp has the man management skills to to reintegrate and you know use him where necessary. But I, I think the team's evolved past him. I think we'd all rather see that more kind of flexible forward who can cover across the front three, almost like a Jota, um, just to to add that extra strength and depth, which which really we're not getting too much from Rigi anymore. I just, I just think for his own, the sake of his own career, for me, I think he, he needs to move now. That there was after that incredible 18 19 season he had it was a bit of a crossroads you either give him the contract and reward him or that is when his value would have been at his absolute peak and, and you sell then and obviously they went down the contract route which nobody had a problem with but yeah james you're absolutely right that the team's evolved a lot since then and for, for the sake of his own career you know if you're looking as a 4-3-3 you've obviously got Firmino, salah mané jota then I'd argue Harvey Elliott would be ahead of him, possibly Firmino as well. So you're looking at maybe a seventh choice or the sixth or seventh choice to get into a 
free. So I think he, he just needs to move now for, for his own career. We'll come on to one or two players who possibly could be on Liverpool's radar in a second. But just in terms of, of AFCON, James, that's been sort of brought up as a thing that Liverpool have to buy because they'll lose Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. But it is only two games. It's Crystal Palace and, and Brentford that they'll miss. Possibly an FA Cup tie in there as well. But those are games that Liverpool should be able to win even without Salah and Mane in the team. And it's probably not the sort of situation where you would go out and buy somebody specifically to cover that period of time? No. Um, there's a piece on the site which is worth checking out in terms of, like, even though it's it's only a small number of games they'd miss for Liverpool, it would be a very fixture-intensive period over at AFCON. Like, it could easily be seven games in a very short space of time. So it's 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 not ideal, and it, it does mean, like, there's the risk that someone comes back with an injury. Hopefully not the case, of course, but... I think it is a little bit more complicated than just it's only two games. But yeah, you're right. It's 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 not something where Liverpool are going to say we need to sign someone because of AFCON. Like, it, in all likelihood, it's even if someone picks up a knock, you know, you're looking at maybe a month's worth of, of missed fixtures. And best case scenario, as you say, it's two games. So yeah, you, you can't, you can't, you just can't sign someone just for that. Like, there has to be some more joined up thinking going on there. That's that's in the realms of Ben Davies panic buying. Um, like, I mean, that's actually panning out quite well financially by the looks of things. But I mean, yeah, it's you, you've got to be thinking more long term than that. You have to find an option who can genuinely improve this front line, offer actual depth, rather than just like, yeah, he could do a job for a couple of games in January. Like, that, that's not how Liverpool are going to recruit someone. It does show the, the squad depth as well that you look at if Salah and Mane were both missing, you'd probably say the front three was maybe Elliot, Firmino and Jota. I mean, you've got Minamino to put into that mix and, and Divock Origi as well is still not even anywhere close. He might get on the bench for those two games at least, but it's still a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? But uh, just in terms of, of possible forward line additions, I mean, the obvious two really for, for me, Kai, to, to look at and, and keep an eye on would be Jonathan David and Ismail Assar purely and simply because they were on the list last summer when Liverpool signed Diogo Jota. But there's not been a huge amount of, of links. Liverpool have been very quiet on, on that front this summer, but it would make it a little bit of sense to me if they were looking at, at someone like that. Possibly that could be something that, that came out of the blue before the deadline. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen Liverpool signings you know, with, with Jota and just dropping down to that that level below and, and picking a, a 30, 40 million pound player and and, and with the work with Klopp on the training ground, kind of bringing them up to Liverpool's level rather than the kind of uh, the other extreme with City, Chelsea going out and buying almost a football manager signing who everybody knows and he'll do in 100 million and, and chucking the money at it. So I think a, a Saab, what was the, the price they wanted last year? 40 million when they were in the championship. So and then now they've got that extra revenue from the Premier League and he had a, a great year as well. They might possibly be looking for even more than that. Um, Harvey Barnes for me would have been the perfect signing um, but again they would have wanted 50, 60 million I would have imagined and of course he's just signed that new contract so I think it's 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 going to be tricky to one identify the player that can come in and, and be at that level and available for that price and then also tricky to if you do identify one go out and, and get the deal done with only a week left of the window because whichever player you want they're going to be presumably a starter for their, their current club and that club is then going to need to replace them as well. So the longer Liverpool leave it, the harder it's going to be. Yeah, certainly time is is running down, James. Is there anyone that you'd look at and think might be a possibility? I know there's been a few more links with Adama Traore, Tottenham apparently looking at, at him as well. I'm still not convinced on him, to be honest, but it does feel like that sort of random type signing would be a, a bit of a Liverpool thing to do. Yeah, it would also be a bit of a James thing to do. Like, I know why you're not convinced on him, but I'd I'd love to see it. Like, he's just fun. Like, and under under Klopp, he he could he could surely. That I mean, all of the raw attributes are there. Surely he could he could shape something out of them. It, it's it's not like he's bad now anyway. His chance creation is still like high. Things like expected assists, he's performing very well, and that's carried over into the first two games of the season. Like, I know Wolves haven't started well in terms of points on the board, but. They've been creating a lot of chances. I think they've created the most chances in the league. It's something along those lines. I saw a stat earlier this morning. And Traore has been a part of that. But um, 
yeah, it, the, the, the problem is it will probably cost more than the gamble would be worth. Because um, it, it, much as he has shown in glimpses what he might be, he, he hasn't shown that he is currently a, a you know a forty million pound player. I, I don't think, I don't think he would warrant it. But you know, if 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 a deal could be struck at a reasonable price point, it would, I'd be very excited by it just because he's that kind of player. Um, yeah, I don't think it'll happen. Um, I've basically been single-handedly banging the drum for Mateusz Cunha um, from the Bundesliga, um, Hertz Berlin. It, the fact that it's another one who's kind of been through the uh, the Red Bull system in the sense that he was at Leipzig before he moved. Uh, it would be an indirect one, but we know that Liverpool have liked those kind of profile players who the Red Bull system have identified in the past. Um, again, he's that kind of undervalued asset sort of thing, which we do see FSG liking. Um, you know, he's, he played quite a bit last season, but it's not necessarily that he's first name on the team sheet. He's the, the star of the team. He's it's just that he's he looks good when he does play. He's been he's been managed well, which is also good for a young player because you don't want someone coming in necessarily who's just been run into the ground. Um, so yeah, it's just it's a lot of potential. It's again like Adama, you'd be signing for what he could be as much as what he is now. But so much of it screams Firmino to me in terms of how we went and got him um, from Hoffenheim. Um, they're not the same player, of course, but there are so many parallels, and it would be, it would be a nice way of just kind of getting in that sort of air. It depends what you want to do with Jota, because if he's the Firmino air, then then you you want someone who's a more flexible forward across the front line. But if you are looking to keep this roughly the same system, and have Jota and another forward for the future, either side of a Firmino like player, I think Cunha is one of the one of the better options you could pick out right now. Yeah, plenty of, of names being linked. But that's all we've got time for on the latest edition of the Liverpool.com podcast. Keep checking the website and the Echo as well, of course, for all the latest updates and news around transfers and much more. Plenty more to come on that front across Blood Red as well this week, as well as build up to that huge game with Chelsea to come on Saturday. Until next time, though, goodbye for now. <laughs>